got it. Welcome to Wednesday night, another night of Bible study here at Christ Community Church. We're so glad to have you, so glad that you joined us on this evening. We believe that we are going to be studying some powerful passages of Scripture in the book of Acts. We're in Acts, the 19th chapter, and beginning at that first verse, just want to also have a, a gentle nudge. Uh, we've gotten participation from the members of the church as far as which direction we go. We pray about it, but we also listen. And some of you said, Pastor, we'd like to uh, study the book of Acts. Well, we have roughly about eight uh, more weeks, maybe nine. Uh, and so that would get us through August and September. Uh, and so be thinking of, of maybe a subject matter or a topic or a uh, Bible passage, a book that you like, uh, or maybe there's a question. And if you give us the question early enough, we can put together a Bible study on that question. And so this is your time to weigh in uh, wherever you are. Uh, contact the office at 708-331-8389 and uh, ask for tequila and leave your Bible suggestion there. And we will retrieve them and uh, who knows where the Lord will take us. But uh, these are some interesting times. We want to prepare for prayer. And uh, I had a chance to, this week, talk to some individuals that were on the prayer list and got great reports, got praise reports. So uh, we thank the Lord for uh, what the Lord is doing with Beverly Watkins and uh, powerful testimony she has of God's uh, manifest glory. Uh, Sister Laura Hill uh, talked to uh, Brother Les on yesterday, and again, the Lord intervened. I've got a praise report. Hallelujah. Uh, just today, thank the Lord, God orchestrating things. Sister Mildred Jones uh, has a praise report. Uh, and so we thank God for these praise reports that are coming through. Uh, we want to still be in prayer, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. But uh, for Elder and Mother King, we want to just lift them up. Elder King uh, and his, this, this loss of weight, we want to just ask God's uh, just intervention there. Uh, Ella Jackson, who is still mourning uh, the transitioning of James, her husband. We want to pray for Ella and her family. Also, uh, Mother or Evangelist. Grady praying for her. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you're just that, a loving Father who loves us with an everlasting love. We thank you that you, as a Father, you're attentive to your children. You care about us. You love us. And you provide for us. Lord, we thank you for the answered prayer. We thank you uh, Lord, that when we pray, you hear and that you respond, and that you have the ability to produce a miracle. We thank you, Lord, even as we uh, study this passage of Scripture on tonight. Um, you have something to say to us about uh, how you move through your word and through the moving of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, let us hear and learn and grow. Uh, we pray for those that are on the prayer list uh, and those that I uh, didn't lift up their names, but, Lord, there ever before you. We pray for divine intervention, and we thank you in advance. Give us divine revelation on tonight, and help us, Lord, as we walk this journey, uh, as you lead the way. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to uh, start out in the 19th chapter. I apologize for the mechanical uh, mishaps on last uh, last Wednesday night, maybe uh, 26 minutes, almost close to a half an hour of broadcast went on, and then uh, we had a power outage. Uh, but we're working on correcting those things and uh, providing you a quality broadcast. Paul is in Ephesus. Uh, he has left um, Corinth 
And um, I thank God for the pastoral nature of Paul. Paul does not leave them teacherless. He leaves a profound teacher. And so in verses 1 through 2, we'll take a look at what that says as far as why Paul leaves and, and what he, he has uh, left in place. It starts out, we'll just read those two verses initially, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, do you have the Holy Spirit when you believe? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Paul was uh, on his way back uh, from Corinth. It was his second missionary journey. And um, he had indicated that he would return, he would come back to Ephesus in the 18th chapter, verse 21. Uh, but he took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And so he had made a promise and he makes a promise, he keeps a promise, but he leaves a prolific speaker, scholar, Bible uh, student there to minister to them. Uh, his name was Apollos. In that 18th chapter, verse 24, it talks about Apollos. It talks about his background. Uh, but in verse 24, it says, he was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. So, uh, here, Apollos was at Corinth uh, doing a wonderful uh, ministry. Um, verse 28 of the 18th chapter, and he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so Paul, that pastoral side of him, he doesn't leave the church of Corinth unattended, but they have a capable brother uh, who is there preaching, refuting, uh, being able to debate, being able to make a case for Christ. Powerful. Um, but as Paul is continuing his travels, he finds or runs across some disciples. Now, I find this passage of Scripture, uh, all of it, just intriguing. Um, if, if we weren't limited to time, I'd really un try to unpack it to even a greater depth. But let me just go to a certain depth here. In verse 2, he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Nowhere else are we finding that this is a recipe for what Paul does when he runs into believers. He doesn't, once he meets them, ask them, uh, do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Ghost? And so there was something that, uh, about these disciples that prompted this question, that prompted this discussion. Uh, had they received the Holy Spirit when they believed? And they responded, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And so the question for me is what was lacking in their presentation, their uh, representation of Christianity, uh, in their representing Jesus. What, what was the clue or the cue for uh, Paul to say, have you received the Holy Ghost? He didn't say, you don't act like you have it, but he asked, had you received it? Now, this is the thing. Um, that's a question that... Um, I want to pose to everyone listening, to everyone who is a member or who says that they're a member of the body of Christ. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Ghost? Because if you have it, you'll know you got it. 
If you don't have it, you'll know you, it's, it's absent and you need to get it. We need to have the power of the Holy Ghost. And for someone who has it to, um, for you to be giving, if you will, cues that you don't have an anointing, you, there's something missing in your spirit or your experience uh, that needs to be corrected because God uh, has it as a gift that he wants to give to you. Um, verse uh, 3 through 4. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. And so in order for uh, them to be saved, they knew enough. And to be called students of Christ. They knew enough, but they didn't know much about Jesus or what he did for us. They knew that he was the Messiah. They knew enough there. They knew enough uh, for, if you will, superficial or preliminary information, but they didn't know much about God's nature and how it was revealed through or in Christ. And so uh, here, uh, the, the promises that he would even send a comforter, that Holy Spirit, and that he would come, uh, ascend from heaven. Um, maybe this was with these disciples that Paul runs across. These, there's a, a few of them like that. It doesn't represent uh, the majority of them. Um, it's a core group that needs to have this experience. And so he says in verse 3, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Okay, so John's baptism is one of repentance. Uh, that there's a Messiah that's coming, Jesus Christ, and you need to repent. Uh, Matthew, the fourth chapter and verse 17 Repent, for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. That one of the first messages preparing us to receive the Savior is recognizing, watch this, recognizing that whatever I'm doing, it's not satisfying. Uh, it's not leading to the kind of long-term happiness or joy. It's not fulfilling. It, Whatever I'm doing outside of Christ, it leaves me empty. It might give me a moment of pleasure, but ultimately I'm empty. And so recognizing that the direction I'm heading is the wrong direction. Because if I want to accept or receive different results, there must be a difference in what I do. And so here, um, Paul is helping them to understand that the baptism of repentance is different from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to help you to understand Christ and his relationship with God and how God's nature is revealed in Christ. And a part of God's nature, uh, you see, I can repent, uh, but what's going to keep me, what's going to teach me, what's going to protect me, who's going to do that? That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Who's going to empower me to live this life? It's the Holy Spirit. Who's going to give me victory over Satan and his kingdom? That's the Holy Spirit. Who's going to have me to better understand the word as I'm reading? That's the Holy Spirit. And so uh, here they had a basic understanding, which was John's preaching of the baptism. But they were in the same place as Apollos was before Aquila and Priscilla in Acts 18, verses 24 through 26. And let me just share this. One of the things that uh, a part of God's nature that is revealed through Christ, God would that none would be lost. So yes, Jesus first came to the Jew, but then he also came to the Gentile. He came to the world. John 1, God so loved the world. And a, a part of this love is um, he would that none would perish, 
And, and so if I was a, and sometimes I, I speak in dispensational language and we talk about uh, the various dispensations and we are in the, right now, the sixth dispensation, which is that of grace. The seventh is the dispensation of the kingdom. Uh, but uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't experience the grace of God as much. They, they did, but not in a uh, universal way. There were individuals that experienced the grace of God, but that wasn't uh, the dispensation that you see in uh, the Old Testament. It's the dispensation of the law. And so under the law, sin, when you sin, the result or the, the, the judgment of sin was death. The wages of sin is death. But in Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, the gift of God, the grace of God. And we experience that through Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's one thing to, to know about a Messiah that's coming, recognize that I need to change my lifestyle, recognize I need to embrace a Messiah that's going to lead me to the Father, recognizing I cannot do it by offerings because they don't satisfy uh, God uh, like uh, the sacrifice that is going to come through Jesus Christ, who will be the, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, uh, recognizing I can't do this by myself. I, I want to change my lifestyle. I want to change the direction. The, there is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof is death. I want to change that. But that's the first step. That's John's baptism, a baptism under or uh, one of repentance. Uh, but not necessarily the faith unto salvation. So John's message pointed to Jesus, but it did not take men and women there uh, itself. Repentance to receive Jesus and receive all that he has uh, for us. And so picking up at verse 4, Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Now the name is lifted up. John led them too, but John was asking even in the, art thou the one, uh, John the Baptist, as he was arrested. And so the, the thought is, there's no salvation, there's no deliverance, there's no empowering of the Holy Ghost through anyone but by, there's no access to the Father and to the gifts of the Father, but by Jesus. Jesus. That's the name that is in contention, meaning that's the name that the world would have us to be quiet about. They'll talk about all kinds of spiritual something. They'll give all kinds of names. You know, I'm religious or I'm spiritual. But you start talking about Jesus. They don't want to deal with Jesus. They don't want to lift up that name because with that name there comes an assertion. Either Jesus was who he said he was or he was a liar and a lunatic. Jesus says that he was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the way. So, there's no other way, Jesus said. No other way. He was the way. You can't develop your own religiosity and say that this is going to work for me. It doesn't work for the Lord. And what you have is a sham and a shame. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Stop. And so John's baptism got them prepared to receive the next level of understanding, which was embracing Jesus. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. And so uh, even when we baptize, I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 
5 through 7. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Stop. And so here they were prepared. They heard the message. They were already disciples. Uh, how do we know? Because in chapter 19, verse 1, finding some disciples, some commentaries uh, and commentators would say that they weren't uh, followers of Christ. No, the t when that term disciples is used, it is generally to depict the following of Christ. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to assert that they were followers of Christ. They just needed to go to a deeper level. Now, let me just say something. For those of you who say, pastor's spending a whole lot of time on those who don't have the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. We can move on. No, I want you to understand that there are deeper levels that the Lord is calling all of us to go to. Every one of us, he's calling us to another level. And the, the shame or uh, sometimes the, uh, the mistake that we make is we act like after a certain age, we act like we've got it. I speak with uh, tongues and a mighty burning fire and, and whatever the, the colloquialism, the church colloquialism that we use. We, we have uh, sayings in the church even uh, before we get up and testify. And we, we, it almost, we give our credentials for giving a testimony. Stop it. The Lord, if, if we were following the path of Christ, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Bend down. Put somebody else on your shoulders. Get out of the spotlight. Give the glory to the Lord. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid hands on them, so we see there's a different way of even receiving. Uh, that's another point. Uh, Paul lays hands on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's different from what you saw in Acts, the first or the second chapter, where the dispensation of the Holy Spirit comes in, and it's almost like this pouring out tongues of fire, light on them. Um, and so there's different ways in which people will experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Your one experience, listen to this, your one experience does not define how every experience ought to be. It was your singular experience. And maybe someone had something similar to yours. But for us to say, unless you get it like this, you don't have it. Paul didn't even do that. He asked them, did they have it? He didn't tell them they needed to get it. So we look at verse 7. It was 12 that were baptized. Verse 8 through 10. And when he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Hmm, I think the Lord has given me my sermon for Sunday. Uh, verse 9. But when some were, ha were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the words of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. It seems like every time the ministry is moving forward, the devil gets busy. Uh, don't feel that you've missed God when difficult times or experiences come your way. You know, it, it's, learn how to, to ride this thing, recognizing that there's going to be uh, some high points in the ministry, and there's going to be some challenging points in the ministry. 
but just make sure that you're where the Lord called you to be and don't allow your feelings uh, to dictate uh, where you're going to be. It ought to be based on knowledge that you know that you know God has spoken to you uh, through various ways, through opening up doors, through the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit, through uh, mature brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, through speaking to you uh, uh, and, and letting you sense that this is the direction. So I gave you about four or five ways in which you can experience God and know that you're where God would have you to be. Stay there. Stay there until God opens another door. Paul stayed there for almost two and a half years preaching the gospel. Some say that it was the time that he preached, it was a, a theater area that he preached at, and it was roughly between 11 uh, a.m. and 4 p.m. that he preached at this theater. Uh, and it was a time in which most people didn't go to work. So I'm, look at the strategy here. Uh, and I pray the Lord would give you illumination. It was around the time that people uh, wouldn't go to work because it was hot during that period of time from 11. You had the noon sun that would come out. And I'm going to tell you, being in Israel, we were there at least three times. And at noon, it was hot. Uh, and we were there in the colder periods. But uh, uh, it, it's so hot that it could burn your sandals off. But nevertheless... Um, Paul used that opportune time at the temple. Most people left that auditorium uh, and would try to find shelter and shade. But the, the, the message of Christ, the message of the gospel, was so powerful that people would come out of their comfort zones and come to hear what the man of God was sharing both Jew in verse 10 and Greeks. Verses 11 and 12. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Hallelujah. And so this is not a formula where... Uh, we're encouraging you to uh, bring napkins on Sunday. But if that's where you are, uh, amen. You, you, if you need a point of contact with, uh, in your, your faith move, you're going to trust Jesus and Jesus. Uh, I'm going to bring some oil um, and uh, ask that Pastor would uh, anoint that oil and then I'm going to take that oil, and it's not just going to be an anointed oil in my house, but I'm going to take that un anointed oil out of my house, and I'm going to carry it in my purse or in my, uh, my pocket. Uh, brothers, we have small little, uh, uh, little uh, bottles that you can put in your pocket, carry around in the car, uh, and I'm going to, when I visit the sick, and we're not going to just use it for hospital visits, when I go by a family member's house, and I know they're not saved, but I'm going to ask before we go, can we have a word of prayer? And I'm going to take that oil out, and I'm going to anoint them and ask God for spiritual healing and physical healing and mental healing. I'm going to ask God for peace in this home where there was no practice of peace but pain. I'm going to ask that there be joy. Hallelujah. Because you've got the Holy Ghost. You've got the Holy Ghost. And that, I believe, is what Paul noticed. That, listen, where the word of God is, there's power. Ha. Power. Shakes things up. Turns things around. Flips things upside down. When God intervenes, he is always a blessing. And it's not that God stopped intervening. It's when uh, my eyes are open and I can see his hand moving. And as I can appreciate the hand of God moving on behalf, not just my behalf, because there's things that I need. But sometimes the Lord says, listen, uh, your deliverance is going to be uh, when you start engaging on serving others. 
because right now it's too much self-serve. I want you to stop self-serving and I want you to serve me as a servant leader. I want you to go out and I want you to start ministering to those who are in need of a miracle. And as you are operating in faith and doing my will, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your circumstance because the premise, this is a point that is good to know. When you take care of God's house, God takes care of yours. Amen. And so here, verse 11 and 12, unusual miracles. It wasn't just diseases left, left them, but evil spirits went out of them. And so some children need to be delivered. Uh, they're bombarding, or being bombarded by all kinds of things on the internet and television and it, things have become so promiscuous and uh, so emotionally damaging. Emotionally. And because, several things, because we are not aware of what our children are exposed to or because we are not uh, engaged enough in their lives, uh, we don't know what influences they're getting and how they're being molded, but we just know that they're disturbed, they're angry. They're, you know, I, I was uh, thinking the other day, you know, as I'm driving on 94 or 294 or uh, 80, and sometimes people are driving, these young people are driving so crazy. And I, I was flipping through the channels of TV one day and the movie Fast and Furious. And I said, you know what? That's really what's happening. The, the, these young people are furious or angry and they just want to go fast, speed. It's an adrenaline rush. Something uh, besides drugs and alcohol and sex to, to get uh, high by. Mm. We need to lay hands on our children and maybe daily pray for them that they're protected and they're blessed. Verses 13 through 16. Let me get there. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Hmm. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Let me stop for just a second uh, because... Uh, I want to pick up on verse 15 in just a moment. But what happens is you have these practitioners of the, uh, the arts, the, the dark arts, magic and, and that sort of a thing, uh, that they're tapping into a source that is not godly. Because there are two sources. There's the Spirit of God and there's the Spirit of Satan. And so they're tapping into not the Spirit of God. Because how do we know? Verse 13, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. It's, it's not who we know, have a relationship with, or preach, but Paul preaches. It doesn't work like that. You, don't, you can't call on the name of Jesus uh, to help you or to move you, and you have no relationship. You have no authority to use that name in that area. You're not one of the children, the sons or daughters of Christ. It is through relationship. If I summarize the Bible, 
in one word. It's about relationships. And Jesus says, listen, if you want to understand the law and the prophets, love the Lord thy God with thy heart, mind, soul, and all thy strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On this rest the law and the prophets. Everything rests on relationship of love of God and your neighbor. It's about relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, but yet you're going to try to tap into the power that comes with the relationship without having a relationship, Hmm. It won't, it won't happen. Now, I'll just share something. In verse 15, and the evil spirit answered, now we can learn something about the evil spirit, and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. Why is that significant? Because the evil spirit is letting us know to this very day that the evil spirit knows its enemies. It knows the names of the enemies. But if you're not a threat to an evil spirit, they don't even know your name. Jesus, I know. Calls him by name. I know him. He's an enemy. And Paul, I know. But who are you? Some might say, I remember there was a, the, a young man, he was kind of mess, mixed up in his theology. And uh, he had come to the church. It seemed as if he had given his heart to the Lord. But then all of a sudden, I didn't see him for a while. And one day, I saw him on Sibley Boulevard, there was a park right next to a cemetery. It was really almost uh, in the cemetery. It wasn't a park, it was a swing inside of a, a cemetery. It's probably for family members who uh, might have wanted to see their, uh, visit the grave of, of the loved one, and so they had a swing that was put there. I see him in that swing in the cemetery. And I said to him, brother, what are, you, what are you doing here? I haven't seen you at church. He said, pastor, I just figured something out. I don't want to get into trouble with anybody. I don't want to get in trouble with the devil, and I don't want to get in trouble with God. So I don't go to church, so I won't cause uh, uh, any problems with the devil. And I went to church that one time, so I wouldn't have any problem with God. I said, brother, your theology is messed up. You're going to have to make a choice. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Notice what happens in verse 16. Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Stop. And so by not making a choice for Christ, by not uh, having your name on the hit list, the enemy list of the devil, the enemy can overpower you. There were, that for believers as well as unbelievers, there's going to be this battle. But God has promised for believers that we're more than conquerors. We have the authority, hallelujah. And not only do we have the authority, we have the power to call upon heaven for help. And heaven, hallelujah, responds. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I'll work it all for your good. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Why? Because it's working patience and that patience have her perfect work that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. The Bible is replete, is full of support. Get your name on the enemy's wanted list. 
Pastor, how do I do that? Be filled with the Holy Spirit and be engaged obediently in the work of the kingdom. This is not playing time. This is fighting time. And we don't know how long we're going to be down here. The enemy has come through with mass deception. There is a way that he has provided for so many, but that way is the way of death. Hmm. Verses 17 through 20. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You know, we, we wonder um, why there's sometimes this conflict in the spiritual realm that's going on. And uh, Paul, as he's preaching, and God is using him in a miraculous way, and you would think that uh, there would be a minimal engagement of evil spirits, but the evil spirits are just as pronounced. Now, let me just explain something to you. What's happening is God will use all of these things to bring him glory. And it's about either I'm going to participate and walk, work alongside of God as he is working things for his glory, or I'm going to step back. The Bible lets me know that he doesn't like a drawback spirit. And so sometimes we, instead of engaging with him, fighting alongside of him, and, and, and knowing that he's got our back, he's got, he's got us covered, he's our protector, he's our provider, he's our shield, he's our Lord of hosts, hallelujah. He's the commander of the army, but he wants you to be in the army, be in the ranks, show up. Yeah, the devil's going to get busy. And God used that encounter to bring him glory. Fear came, it, it, it shook some folk up. They recognized that this is real. Verses 17 through 20. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was what? Magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. This is a powerful thing of repentance. Uh, that's why it's good for us to talk about what we're repenting from. I, I was a, a drunk, or I was uh, st struggling with alcoholism, or I was struggling with pornography, or I was struggling with lying, or I was, you know, stealing. Uh, but the Lord saved me. He met me and made a difference in my life. Because sin operates best in secrecy. But when you expose it, notice what they're doing. They're confessing and telling their deeds. Many who believed came confessing and telling their de deeds. It means that they're serious about repentance. Verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, getting rid of it. Stop for just a second. Um, Sometimes we need to take an inventory of our house. What are things, masks, portraits, what are things that link, link us into uh, demonic, the, the move of the demonic? What are things that, that do not glorify God? What are things that need to be removed from our home? We might not have thought of it as a shrine or, or idolatry, or we might not have even given it much, um, much attention. But some things need, we need a house cleaning. You know, 
uh, spring cleaning uh, comes that time of the year. The spring, the windows are open, the doors are open, and, and you do some extra cleaning. We need to do some cleaning, spiritual cleaning of our homes, sanitizing. Oh, that's a better example. Uh, with this COVID-19 going forth, and look at here. Thank you, Jesus. That's like, like an insight the Lord gave me. Just like we were particular about getting Clorox and every other ammonia and bleach that we could get soap and sanitize and clean every nick and current, I sense the Lord is saying, I want you to clean your house. Not just your physical house, your temple. Clean it. Clean yourself. Sanitize. Church, I'm going to have to move along because I, I see I'm just at uh, verse 19. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Somebody, someone counted that to be uh, over a million dollars. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Why? Because people did what they were supposed to do. And idolatry was renounced. Verses 21 through 22. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, I have, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but uh, he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So we see that he's still coordinating things and sending uh, support out. Uh, he's wanting to support the church in Jerusalem, and so he's wanting to get there. Um, in verse 23 through 28, what happens? And about that, that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. This is one of the uh, other times that the term the way is used. The way is, a, uh, is symbolic of, of the, the church, the disciples of Christ, the followers of Christ, because Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the way. And so they named themselves this Christian group the way, or they were called the way. But there was a great commotion. Why was there a great commotion? For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of the of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity in this trade or by this trade. Moreover, see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Verse 28, or verse 27 through 28. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Matter of fact, uh, this area and this temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it was a spe spectacular sight to see. I had a chance with my wife to see in India the Taj Mahal, when they say a wonder, they're not kidding. Some of these places that we've seen, they are spectacular. Just the artistry or the craftsmanship, uh, the, the given to details. Uh, when we were walking to the Taj Mahal, you, you initially, you couldn't see it except through almost something uh, as small as a keyhole, and you're just looking, and as you, the closer you get, the larger you get as far as a picture, but even the small, tiny little area that we could look at, I wish I had a thought to have pictures of the Taj Mahal uh, as I'm teaching this Bible study, but 
Uh, the closer you got, the more broad the vision got so that you could see. And when you finally walked through the door and you stood before the Taj Mahal, you were struck by its beauty. And you know, it's a crypt that a king created for his wife because of his great love for her. But it's a beautiful crypt. Now, when verse 28, when they heard this, they were full of wrath. What were they full of wrath about? They were deceived. They were deceived. They were, th they were being told that Paul was disrupting their economy. Money drives a whole lot of things. And sometimes we'll be surprised at the impact of money. We've got to be careful because the love of money, it's not money, but it's the love of it is the root of all evil. So be careful in how people will try to manipulate. Listen, uh, if you take care of God's house, you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. God has given us a, a, a system of giving, and, and I'm going to tell you, it works, it works, it works. It works. I'll tell you about it in a minute. And so in verse 28, they are deceived. But what they're saying is when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, uh, let me just put it like this, just so you know what's going on. Uh, here, they're upset at the words of Paul or, or, or not Paul, but uh, uh, of Demetrius, who uh, is inciting a riot. And it's at the temple, at the, uh, the auditorium, where Paul has been preaching for almost two and a half years. And can you imagine, the, it, it's already designed to speak without microphones like we've got. Our sound system is elaborate. They didn't have that kind, but they had it set up where uh, the, the voices could carry. So that's why even at the theaters, uh, the actors are on at the bottom, but the way they built the theaters, uh, you could hear their voices, uh, even if they, pro they didn't project it as loud, but you could hear their voices all the way to the top rafters. Uh, here, this, this um, auditorium that's designed to enhance sound, and can you imagine they're screaming out, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is, and that continues to start building momentum, momentum. Paul had been preaching the gospel and now he is uh, being scrutinized. Uh, and this crowd has lost it because they see Paul as someone who has come in and hit them in the pocket. Verse 29, so the whole city was filled with confusion. So I said that the, the city was confused. They're filled with confusion. Uh, God is, we, we know, is, is not in this because he's not the author of confusion. So who is the author of confusion? If God is not the author of confusion, the devil is. So the devil has released the spirits of confusion. I, I can almost see him sitting on his little raggy taggy thrown and sending out his demons go forth and cause confusion. That's why even wherever we are, church, I want you to get this, wherever you are and you, you know you've got the Holy Spirit, you know therefore you are an emissary or an ambassador for Christ, go in and start, when there's uproar, when there's a lack of peace, start declaring peace 
start rebuking that spirit. Recognize that it's not just that one person who's getting up or a bunch of people or a group or, or uh, listen, uh, it's demonic, but God can be glorified. You begin to bind that spirit and cast that spirit out and pray for the spirit of peace. Make sure that you have peace the peace that surpasseth all understanding, and you're leaving your peace in that place through your prayers. So when the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater, rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Artis, Macedonius, Macedonians, Paul, Paul's travel companions, and when Paul wanted to go in to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent, him, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Now listen, so, and I've got to move along quickly, but Paul sensed, listen, I'm a man of God. I've got the peace of God, and I ain't scared. I'm not saying it loud, the, the colloquialism, scat, 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 I ain't scat, whatever. I'm not scared. I'm going forth in the name of the Lord. But the other disciples, his friends, uh, those who maybe were impacted by the gospel, pleaded with him, don't do it. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. Now you know that's pathetic. They didn't even know why they were there. Just confused. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude and the Jews, putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Two hours crying out. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of, of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of the temple nor blasphemers of your goddess. Now, who's doing the talking here? Verse 35, the city clerk. God will raise up someone to fight your battle. You don't feel, have to feel that you have to find, fight them all yourself. Let me read on. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called a question for today's uproar, and there being so uh, no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And Romans were uh, a death on disorderly or riotous uh, gatherings. They came out with their soldiers and strong armed and put it to, to rest. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. The assembly said, hey, we're not going to push this thing. We don't want to incite the Romans. We don't, want to, we don't want their soldiers to come and squash this thing and maybe go overboard and kill some of us uh, for a lie. Paul was not guilty of the things that we cried out for. There's no case, a legitimate case. What a work, and if, as we just take a look at uh, the life of Paul, what a man, what a man. And God is challenging us to be men and women of like nature. Paul was just an example of how we ought to be diligent when it comes to uh, 
sharing the gospel, the good news of God. We thank God for Jesus, and we thank God for a great Bible study. We did get through it, and we had to rush those last few minutes, but may you be blessed by the word of the Lord. I want to encourage you to uh, continue to uh, be faithful in your giving. God sees it, and God rewards it. Uh, there's a bike club that we're starting at the church, C. Elder Reed. Homeless ministry will be going out at the last Saturday. Please see, call the office, talk to Sister Tequila. There is a staff meeting on this coming Tuesday, July 27th at 7 p.m. I'd like for everyone to be who is staff in attendance. May God bless you. We're going to close out in prayer. And if you're not born again, ask him to come in and save you and fill you with the Holy Ghost. Father, we just thank you for your bountiful blessing. I thank you for this wonderful time of Bible study. Uh, Lord, I thank you um, that you're so good. I thank you for the life of Paul who challenges us to live a life, have a life worth living, and that's a life that follows Christ. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And we want a special little shout out. Dr. J's uh, birthday is tomorrow. I don't think she'll mind me telling that she's 62, uh, but uh, she doesn't look a day over 25. God bless you. You all have a great night.